Hello, welcome to Muggles and Mocha, a Harry Potter book club. Uh, today we're going to be discussing chapter 10. And once again, I am just loving this. It's so fun and I hope that you enjoy these videos if you've been keeping up with them. Uh, if you're new here, uh, this is our Harry Potter book club that's connected to my editing website, madisonkdarby.com. Uh, I write articles every week. You can check out the one for this week in the description of this YouTube video. Uh, and if you enjoy, please like and subscribe to my channel. And you can follow me on social media too, which is located on my website. Uh, and I post different things throughout the week about Muggles and Mocha, but also writing advice uh, if you're a writer and you're interested in that. So, a lot of stuff going on right now. <laughs> we talk about Harry Potter and we also drink coffee. I have an awesome drink today. It's not technically coffee, but it's a frozen hot chocolate from the Coffee Hall, which is a place in town. Look, oh my gosh, I'm so ready. And I have been not drinking it so that it would look good for this video, but now I'm just gonna mix it up and start eating the whipped cream while we talk about Harry Potter. Oh, and I almost forgot. I have my rant stick, my wand, which I almost forgot. <laughs> but yeah, I just hold on to this when I get very passionate, so get ready. You guys, there are marshmallows in this whipped cream. What even? Mmm. And I also got this bagel. It is a keto bagel. And it's actually really fantastic. It's cheddar and jalapeno, and I've never had anything keto before. So yeah, I'm gonna be eating that too while we're talking because it's almost lunchtime and I'm hungry. <laughs> so now that I've reviewed my food <laughs> for you guys, we are going to be talking about chapter 10, and let me just say, TROLL IN THE DUNGEON! Oh dear. Okay, I couldn't really yell it because I'm actually in my apartment, so can't yell in here. <laughs> but yeah, we're covering chapter 10, which is Halloween. Uh, very, very exciting for a lot of reasons, so let's just jump into it. Okay, so we begin with Harry and Ron recovering from their crazy discovery um, on the night of the Midnight Duel. So they find Fluffy, the three-headed dog, and start brainstorming about this package that Harry knows about that Hagrid picked up from Gringotts and how that could be whatever this dog is guarding. Um, later that morning, they go to the Great Hall and Harry gets his new Nimbus 2000 from Professor McGonagall. And can I just say, when it comes to Harry, do we just have a lot of special treatment? Like, they better be buying brooms for everybody, especially those like who can't really afford it. I think what bothers me is like, Harry's really rich. <laughs> like, he has a lot of money. Maybe they don't know that, but I just thought that was weird that they buy him like the best broom on the market and then like, do Fred and George Weasley get one? Dunno, it bothered me a tiny bit. Then Harry gets to learn all about Quidditch. Uh, I know I brought this up last week, but again, what do you think about Quidditch? What do you think about the rules? Um, I actually did some more research after last week's video and apparently JK Rowling gets asked that question a lot and I think it gets on her nerves. <laughs> People ask her a lot about the whole 150 points thing and I actually think that she provides a little story about that, that back when Quidditch was first being played and created, there was someone who bet 150 galleons on whoever would catch the snitch first. And so then the tradition continued that whoever catches the snitch wins 150 points for their team. So like, there's a background to it. Uh, like I said, I don't have much of a problem with it. I'm just listening to a podcast <laughs> of somebody who does. So um, I actually had though, um, a fan, Ashton Jones. Um, he is a huge sports guy and he really likes Quidditch and said that he would like to play it. So shout out to Ashton for sticking up for Quidditch there. Harry gets to learn some of the Quidditch rules. And I always really liked the differences between all of the different balls. Did you know that the quaffle falls more slowly than a normal ball? And apparently that invention revolutionized the game of Quidditch. So the more you know. And also bludgers, very cool. Um, besides, you know, brooms and flying and basically everything about the game, <laughs> I thought that bludgers were like the most magical and daring of 
the balls when it came to the game, and I just thought that blunders were very funny uh, when I first learned about them. When it comes to the different Quidditch positions, what player would you want to be? Uh, this was actually kind of a hard question for me. So, gotta hold this. It'll help me concentrate. I don't think I could be a seeker because my eyesight is super bad. <laughs> Not good, so I'm just gonna go ahead and throw that out there. Um, I maybe could have been a chaser, but that position has just always been kind of boring to me. I don't know, like passing, just passing the ball. I mean, I guess there's a lot of cool maneuvers you would be doing, but I just don't feel that. Okay, this surprised me, but I actually think I would want to be a beater because I love games where you, you know, like you have to hit a ball, like, you know, softball, tennis, uh, pickleball is super fun. So I think that like hitting the bludger would be fun. Maybe not hitting it at people. That's where I would have trouble. <laughs> but maybe I could have been a beater, gotten a thicker skin. I mean, you can just think of it as protecting your team rather than attacking the others. <laughs> I don't know. What Quidditch player would you be? Let me know. So as Wood goes on talking to Harry, uh, we found out he doesn't know what basketball is. And okay, okay, look, I'm not trying to pick the books apart, all right? It just, those are things I can talk about for a long time rather than just like going through the chapter. But he doesn't know what basketball is. But then they just start like throwing golf balls around for practice. Like, I wonder what sports made their way into the wizarding world as in like a lot of wizards would know about them. Obviously, I, well actually I shouldn't say obviously. I don't know how popular basketball is in the UK compared to America. Like, basketball is huge here and I just don't know, especially in the 90s. Like, I don't know how popular it would have been uh, in Scotland. <laughs> so, you know, maybe that's the reason and golf was. Uh, we do know that rugby is actually known in the wizarding world and it's kind of popular, the Scottish rugby team. J.K. Rowling wrote a very funny article about that. You should look it up. I didn't get to um, go through it in much detail, so I can't remember exactly what happened, but basically um, a wizard who was gonna be going to Hogwarts had a muggle friend and wanted him to be in Hogwarts too, so he somehow snuck him in uh, at, until they got to the sorting ceremony, and then the sorting hat was like, this person is not a wizard. So yeah, big deal, but then, from what I understand, that muggle went on and started playing rugby. People knew about him. I don't know, go look it up because it was funny. Harry finds out about the Seeker's job in the game. It's very impressive that he was chosen for this. Like, the Seeker is super important and they have to be very athletic and fast and just agile. And it's cool that Harry gets this opportunity as an 11 year old uh, where a lot of kids just don't have that type of inborn talent. After Quidditch, we get the famous Wingardium Leviosa scene, swish and flick. And then Ron says something mean about Hermione, and I really don't think he intended for her to hear him. Uh, obviously, Hermione had been getting under his skin throughout the whole book up to this point. Not gonna like defend that Ron said something mean about her, but I think his nerves were just a bit frayed <laughs> from all the interactions they had had so far. And we get sad Hermione, which, pitiful, very sad. She just cries in the bathroom all day. Like an 11 year old girl, that has to be such a huge, huge hit to your self-esteem when you're in a new place and trying to figure out your part in it, um, trying to make friends. So I really feel for Hermione there. They have the Halloween feast. And can I just say the feast at Hogwarts. I love food. <laughs> I'm not conquering this very well. It is very good. Uh, but yeah, I would love to be at a Hogwarts feast. Like how many feasts do they have a year? What all is included? What makes it a feast? Because I feel like they just have food a lot in the Great Hall. I mean, it's where they eat. But you know what I mean, like a massive amount of food. So what does it take to be a feast? I don't know, but I want to go <laughs> to one. <laughs> and then Professor Quirrell comes in. We get Troll in the Dungeon. I'm not going to yell it again or whisper yell it, you already got that. <laughs> and Harry and Ron realize that Hermione does not know about the troll because they know she's been crying in the bathroom all day. Uh, and we see, you know, they're, they want to find her. They 
think that this is really important. I, Ron feels pretty guilty that it's his fault that she is in said bathroom. So they go after her and we see the mountain troll in all its disgusting glory. <laughs> Uh, and we later learn that this troll was brought in by Quirrell, which is kind of impressive seeing his disposition and how nervous he is that he works with trolls. Um, and actually that brings me to Quirrell's character. I kind of want to talk about him today. He's a very interesting person and as usual, uh, I, I love researching the articles that J.K. Rowling has written about the Harry Potter universe, and she has written one on Professor Quirrell's background. Uh, it's very cool. Apparently, Quirrell is young. Uh, it mentions that he's a young man in the book, but in the movies, I don't think he looks that young. <laughs> so I always thought he was older, like maybe more around Snape's age, who is also young, but older than Quirrell. But yeah. Uh, Quirrell is apparently very young, very smart. He was a really gifted student, but he does just naturally like have very fragile nerves, which had people making fun of him, maybe not viewing him in the light that he wanted them to. So as a result, he had this intense desire to make people notice him and he wanted to do something great um, so that he could get the respect that he felt he deserved. So because of that, he for real went out looking for Voldemort. I don't think I ever realized this when I read these books. I always thought that Quirrell stumbled upon him. We know that he went on this like big tour uh, before he started his Hogwarts position. And, but apparently he, he went after Voldemort. It was not an accident. He was legitimately looking for him. I think he viewed it like as a win-win. Um, you know, like people would would respect him because he was able to find the Dark Lord, see he was alive, and maybe get rid of him. I don't know if that was really his uh, uh really his intentions. I think they were a bit more. I don't want to say malevolent, but kind of not very good. I, I he it says that he wanted to learn skills from Voldemort if he found him. Like at best, that might be what happened. Um, that would ensure he was never laughed at again. So. Um, I don't know what all he was wanting to learn from Voldemort, but uh, that was something that drove his uh, desire to look for him. But unfortunately, as we know, um, Voldemort possessed him. And I think this isn't something we really realize in the book either. We think that maybe like Quirrell was on Voldemort's side and he wanted uh, or, or shared the same views as Voldemort and the same mission, but that's not the case. Like Voldemort possessed him and it does say that Quirrell tried to put up a resistance on some occasions, but was not able to, which is pretty sad. And J.K. Rowling does say that he wasn't possessed because he was weak-minded per se. Like, he, like I said, he was very bright and did have a strong mind, but he was naive and arrogant and Voldemort was able to take advantage of that and literally possess him and have him kill people and drink unicorn blood and disfigure him in a horrific way. Like, yeah, just wanna say that Quirrell, like that was not his intention. <laughs> he was definitely being forced um, against his will to do these things. So don't know if that changes your opinion of him, but I thought it was kind of interesting. And J.K. Rowling also says that Quirrell is technically a temporary horcrux, which I feel like is a big deal. Uh, I, I don't really know what that means for him. She makes a point in the article to say, and I thought this was super interesting, that he, when he's possessed, he doesn't lose his soul, which I'm like, what? But I think she's meaning that he's still in there. Um, and with Voldemort being attached to him, I guess that's kind of why he's a Horcrux. Uh, horcruxes are a very mysterious subject for us, even after reading the books. There are two things that J.K. Rowling didn't describe in the Harry Potter books because they were so dark, which is kind of intense to think about that maybe there was something that she thought that shouldn't go in a children's book <laughs> because it was just too evil too dark, too disturbing, I don't know. But those two things were how to make a Horcrux and how Voldemort took on his scary baby form in the fourth book. You know what I'm talking about. Um, I have thoughts on these, specifically the second that I heard a theory lately 
that is very dark. We might talk about it when the time comes. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, we'll talk more about both of those things later. So yeah, with Horcruxes being so such a mystery, I don't really know what it means that Quirrell was partly one. Was it just because like literally Voldemort's soul was residing in him, which is what a Horcrux is? What did it take for them to join like they did? I don't know. I don't know if I want to know. <laughs> So, as Quirrell slowly comes to the forefront of the book, that's what we know about him. So, our trio, or really Harry and Ron, uh, protect Hermione, they fight the troll, and you know what? I'm really proud of them! They are 11 years old, and they actually do, I feel like, a kind of okay job for children fighting a troll. Um, it doesn't really get in many punches, and they take it out. <laughs> in the aftermath, they are discovered by the teachers. Uh, and Hermione lies to get the boys out of trouble. I've heard people ask, why did she lie? Like, couldn't she have just told the truth and say, like, she didn't know about the troll. They came to warn her and saved her. Um, but I have thoughts about this. I do think the boys still would have gotten in trouble because knowing that, that she wasn't aware of the troll, you know, they had time to tell a prefect about this or or could have brought someone with them <laughs> that was an adult. <laughs> so I think that if the teachers had known the truth that they still would have gotten in trouble for being reckless. Um, but because Hermione acts like, you know, she was gonna do this no matter what and she ran off, um, I think that that gives the impression that the boys didn't think they had any time to tell anybody about this and that they were just doing it out of you know, to, to stop her from fighting the troll, whatever, and kind of puts them in a more positive light. So that's why I think she lied about it, and I think it was necessary. Okay, and I'll just say, I am high-key bitter. They only got five points each from fighting a troll? Like, come on, I, how does this point system work? Like, we're gonna talk about that as the books go on. I feel like sometimes they get a massive amount of points for something, or a speci more specifically, they lose different amounts of points for different things, and I just don't know, like, how do you decide how many points people lose? Not sure. But anyway, our trio is formed. What a famous moment in the book series. Actually, this is what our article is about this week. I talk about how there were certain facets of this experience with the troll that follows them throughout their friendship, and we can see how these principles come back into play. Oh, goodness, I got a brain freeze. Oh, dear. I don't think I've gotten those since I was like a kid. <laughs> so yeah, check out that article. Uh, it was fun to write. Always love writing about Harry, Ron, and Hermione. What can I say? During their fight with the troll, Harry and Ron see Snape um, on their way to find Hermione. And this is something that comes back as we know. They get the suspicion that Snape let the troll in. We know that wasn't the case and he was really just trying to stop whoever was trying to get past the troll. At this point, and I may be completely wrong on this, it's been a while since I've read this book, but it almost seems like Snape thinks that Quirrell was the one who was going after it. Uh, and it just makes me wonder of like, why keep him around? I guess they didn't have definitive proof. That has to be what it what it is. But um, yeah, we know that Snape wasn't really doing those things, but JK Rowling really sets him up in this book as a good old villain that uh, we suspect of, of, of doing this. You know, if it's, if it's your first time reading the book, she really heavily tries to make us think that it's Snape, but no. We have our last couple of lines of the chapter, which incidentally are some of my favorites. In the article, I actually write about how in my old copy of the Sorcerer's Stone, like the hardback and everything, which I can't find here. I think it must be at my parents' house, um, which is sad. I, I wasn't able to find it. But I underlined these last lines in that book and then wrote awesome with a smiley face beside it in purple pen. It's really cute and I just love finding that. But these are the last couple of lines. But from that moment on, Hermione Granger became their friend. There are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other, and knocking out a 12-foot mountain troll is one of them. So yay, for the rest of the book series, 
Hermione is friends with Harry and Ron. It was a dark world without her. <laughs> Next week, we're actually gonna be covering two chapters, both 11 and 12. Um, 11 is mostly a Quidditch match, and there's just not too much for me to say about it unless I give a play-by-play -play with Lee Jordan. So yeah, we're covering chapters 11 and 12, and the article is actually about the Mirror of Erised and loss. Uh, it gets real. <laughs> I'm really excited um, to show it to you guys because I had such a good time writing it and hopefully you like it. It's I got a little emotional in it because it's just it's just hard seeing someone deal with loss um, and then have something like what Harry sees in the Mirror of Erised dangling in front of them uh, would just be torture. So yeah, <laughs> brief teaser for next week. Okay, that's about all I have for today. Uh, we've covered chapter 10. We don't have that much more, especially since we're covering two chapters um, next week. It's not going to be that much longer before we're at the end of this book. And I just really like taking it in this way. We can dwell on every single detail and gosh... I love doing this with my time. <laughs> so yeah, again, if you like these videos, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the little bell uh, on YouTube so that you can get notified whenever a new video is released. Uh, follow me on social media where I just post random stuff <laughs> about Harry Potter and writing. And I'll see you guys next week. I'm still not to the bottom of this, but soon. It's a very soupy mix now. Still delicious, but anyway, I'll see you guys next week. Bye.